starting in verse number 14. And we will read through verse 20 because that is the context in which this teaching takes place and we don't like taking anything out of its context. James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? You know, if I were to ask each one of you a question, and you don't have to answer out loud, because I know some of you, if I ask you a question, you probably will answer out loud. So let me just set that stage very clearly. But if I were to ask you the question, why do you serve Christ? I think that all of us would probably have the same type of answers. At least we'd be going in the right direction. You know, out of obedience, I serve Jesus. He first loved me, and He called me out of darkness into light, and I, I serve Him because He saved me. Uh, but, you know, we can give our whole slew of answers according to that question. But I think ultimately we all would say that I serve Jesus not only because He first loved me, but in essence, we all want to go to heaven, don't we? I don't think any one of us would outright say, I don't want to go to heaven, not me. No, I think we would all honestly say that we serve Jesus, not just because He first loved me, but because we do. We, we all want to go to heaven. Denominations are formed that way. We all have religion, and all in that attempt to go to heaven. But Proverbs chapter 14, 12 reminds us when we think about that, and we sang about it even when we began our service, Lord, I want to go to heaven because hell is an awful, awful place. But Proverbs 14, 12 says clearly, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Well, that's pretty troubling, isn't it? Because we all think that we're heading the right way to heaven. But obviously there's a way that we can go that we think is right, and it not actually be right, it's wrong. And that when we get to the end of this, this road called life, we don't want to be wrong on this subject. And this is what James has been talking about, that truth that he's been emphasizing. And what the really the whole of God's Word has been emphasizing is that your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and that's what we are as Christians, right? We, we profess Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And we, we want to know that that is the right thing to do, that we're heading in the right direction. But it's evidenced by, more by what we do than what we say. And we all like to say, and we all verbalize the fact that, yes, I want to go to heaven. But the Scriptures reminded us that you know, we might think that we're heading that way, but in all essence, you're not. Well, that's very troubling. Well, thank the Lord that He has provided us truth in our, our path called life and how we are to make it to the end of this path called life and make it as with a faith that's genuine, that's real, that's going to get me into heaven. Because that's really the ultimate goal, isn't it? You know, if I ask you the question also, if I'm, if I'm in... Orlando, Florida, say, or if I'm in Panama City, Florida, and I head east, that's never eat shredded wheat. I'm not, a, I've told you I've joked around this before. I'm not good with directions. I'm thankful that my wife has stuck with me for 34 years. I've always ended up in the right place. But if I headed east from Panama City, am I going to end up in Bogalusa, Louisiana? Am I going to end up in Popperville? Why not? I'm going the wrong direction. Will I ever, if I keep going east, am I ever going to reach my destination of Bogalusa, Louisiana? G well, no, we can't. We're not using GPS. We're going east. 
I know for sure we're going east. Am I ever going to end up at my house in Bogalusa? No, I'm not. Okay, this is not a trick question, guys. No, it's not. I am never going to end up. Why? Because I'm heading in the wrong direction. I've tried this before, coming from certain areas, and I ended up in Kentucky, and that's not a good place to be. I've never lived it down. So this truth, knowing that what we do is more important than what we say, is highly valuable for us. It's very, it's, it's very, very important that we understand that the path that we're heading is the right path, heading in the right direction. And that truth that James is talking about with those scriptures that we just read is really on the most deepest and most important levels spiritually possible. Because he's not talking just literally about beliefs in general. He's talking about a foundational belief in saving faith. I don't want to just believe in something. I don't want to just believe that the saints are going to win the Super Bowl again. And we all just think or we can believe in something, but it not necessarily be true. I want to know that if I'm putting my faith in Christ, that what the, the real faith that I'm placing in Him is the right faith, and it's going to get me to heaven. Right, church? That's the goal. So if a person who professes Christ as Savior doesn't live a Christ-centered, honoring life, his faith is a fraud. It's imitation faith. So how do we know what that is? How do we know what imitation faith looks like? So this is a really big deal. Chapter 2, as we just read in verse 17, James described imitation faith as being dead faith. Did you hear that? Verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He goes on to say, say later in verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Dead faith means that you're spiritually dead. That means you have no knowledge of Christ. That means that your profession that you claim to have had is not real. Dead faith means you're lost. Dead faith means that you're unsaved. Dead faith means that you're unregenerate. Dead faith means that you're hellbound. That's not where I want to be. What about you, church? I don't want to be there. And I don't want to think that I have lived this life putting my faith in something that's not real. I want to know what's real. So a, so a person with dead faith, he does not and he cannot produce works that are truly good. And Jesus, I've read this Scripture several times as we started this context of Scripture. He repeatedly emphasized that the basic Gospel truth is by saying that this mere intellectual acceptance of truth is not a saving faith. He emphasized it by saying in Matthew 7, 16 through verse 20, He says, you, this is Christ speaking, He says, you will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. He didn't say you will know them by their faith. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. I want to know that my fruit is good. It's not rotten. It's not imitation. It's not something I think it is, but really is not. Deception. So I think that you'll all agree with me that this subject has eternal consequences. Extremely important. And this is why we've been spending so much time understanding what dead faith looks like. And James also understands the importance of getting this right. So he gives us, provides us three characteristics of what false, dead, worthless faith is. What it looks like. Not hypothetically, but literally what it looks like on an everyday basis, is the signs 
Are they pointing towards Bogalusa? Are they pointing east towards New York? Well, I want to know that I'm heading the other way. I'm heading west instead of east. James clearly says it in verses 14 through 20. So the first characteristic that we looked at a couple weeks ago was dead faith is an empty confession. Found that in verse 14. So what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says, that's the, the verbiage, he speaks like, yeah, I've got faith. But if someone says he has, has faith but does not have works, he says, can that faith save him? And James says, nope, cannot. The second characteristic, dead faith, is having false compassion. We looked at this last week, verses 15 through 17. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Well, the third characteristic, and this is the final one he's talking about on the negative aspect, because we're going to get into, as we move on through after verse 20, into a positive aspect of what it looks like to have real, live, active, genuine faith. Well, he first starts out with these negatives. Well, the third characteristic that James points out to us, if you have dead faith, is that you have a shallow conviction. Hmm. Are your convictions strong? You stand on them. And what I mean by that is shallow conviction means that you have a, a recognition of certain facts about God and His Word. But you don't have really any real commitment to either one of them. I know about them. I know, I know the Bible. It's real. I'll never deny it as being God's holy Word. But a one that has imitation faith never offers a full commitment to serving it. The truth in it. Actually applying it. Not just saying, yeah, it, it, amen, that's the Word of God, but actually doing something about it. So verse 18, where James says, and he uses the word someone, you notice that? He's referring to himself. Now, he's using the third person here out of humility, but he's not boasting. And he's not trying to prove that his own Christian life is better than someone else's. He's trying to make a point here. Because in this verse, James isn't speaking primarily about faithfulness in the faith, but he's talking about faith itself. Does that make sense to you when I say that statement? Not just talking generally, he's talking about faith itself. His point is that anyone who claims to have faith, anyone, and if, of course if you're in church, you probably have made a claim that I am a, I'm a believer. And you have your own standards for what you've set when you say I've, I'm a believer because I have, and you go list your point. But his point is that anyone who claims to have faith and that nothing else is necessary to add to that faith, or you can say it another way, or that faith can, if that faith that you claim to have can stand alone in front of God and you can add nothing to it, is it real? And I'm saying to you, and James is saying to you, your salvation, that, it's ridiculous to think that way. If you think, I have come forward, I've made a profession of faith, and there's nothing else that follows, nothing else that even resembles what the Scriptures clearly show us, that this is what it means to be a believer, and there's nothing that follows that profession, I'm saying to you, and James is saying to you, your faith is a fraud. Fraud. Now, David, are you saying that I'm saved by my works? No, I'm not. We're saved by grace through faith. And not of yourselves is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But if you think for one second that you can be saved and there's nothing else that follows in a, in a desire to please the God that saved you, I'm, I'm saying to you, your faith is a fraud. Scripture's saying it. Now I know James has been pounding this into our head. But the truth is, you cannot demonstrate a faith, a kind of faith. Because if there's no 
works that follow it, and you're trying to demonstrate that my faith is real, I'm saying to you, you have nothing to demonstrate it with. You can't produce good works. Very clearly. Without faith, you cannot produce good works. And this is James' point. And that's what the previous verse even says, verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is what? It's dead. Living faith always produces good fruit. That's the point. Because the nature and the very purpose of fruit is to produce something good. The fruits of the Spirit. Where do you think that all comes from? Do you think that fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is just invisible? Hypothetical? No, it's real. It's something that is produced from the tree that is live and active. Dead faith does not produce good fruit because it cannot produce good fruit. Does that make sense? That's what, that's what Jesus said. Just because you remember having an experience in life, a point that you gave your life to Christ, and even remember the date, the time of that event, if it does not have anything that follows it, it's not real. It's just an experience. It wasn't genuine. The only certain proof in a life that has Christ centered and that has been saved by His grace is a life, is the life that's lived after that point. Does that make sense? Because we can all claim it. Claim to you all day. If I, if I said to you, you know what, guys? I've been here 15 years. Did y'all know that I was a millionaire? And you'd think, How do we know that? Well, I mean, I know that I bought a bunch of vehicles, but they haven't been Rolls Royces and Lexus and Porsches, the Porsche 911 Targa, which is the car that I... No, I won't either. Never mind. So <laughs> don't get me started in that area. But there's no way that I could prove to you that I was a millionaire after the 15 years that I've known me because there's been no fruits that would show that I am in any way, shape, or form. So your best reasonable observation of me is, no, David, you're really not. You're just saying it. Well, that's, what's the difference between that and a believer? Just because you go to church doesn't mean anything. What is your desires? What is the fruit that's being produced from your life? And I'm going to list those. just So that, again, we, we listed these a couple weeks ago. I wanna, I'm, we'll end with this. Because I want you fresh out of this teaching from James, knowing exactly what those fruits are supposed to look like. Just fresh on your mind. And this is why Jesus made a very pointed statements. Very pointed statements. And not, not just Him. Other, other apostles have written on this. On this very pointed statements about mere intellectual acknowledgement of Christ. It, does, it doesn't hold any water. Let's just, let me, I know that these are fairly lengthy, but I'm going to give you just three. I've offered those to you in your notes, but Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 46. But I just need you to hear them. I need you to understand what Christ and his, the point that he's making is that mere acknowledgement of him is just not, it's not enough. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do? You hear that? Boom, underline Luke 6 46. The things which I say. Verse 47, Whoever comes to Me and hears My sayings and does them. You see, there's always action. It's not, okay, I'm believing in Christ, but after that point of belief, it's, it's followed by some action. If I say to Tabitha, Tabitha, I love you with all My heart, and after 34 years, I've never done anything to prove that. Is she really going to believe Me? No. Why do you think... Why do you think that you can believe why why do you think it can be even believable that you can say I'm a believer in Christ and nothing follows that in its in your service? 
Verse 47, let me end that. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. It's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not, be, and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing, it's like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Did nothing? All the way through life thinking, oh, I've got this. I've been a faithful member of a church for all these years. I've got this. John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do. Here we go again. That action statement, as I have done to you, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who has sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Fruits, works. It's not saving a person, it's showing that you're saved. And the last one I'm going to read, seven, Matthew 7, 21, probably the most sobering, I think, of all of these. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness. That's not the way you want to end the story. Is it? I've given you others, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse John chapter 2, all the same type of verbiage. It's all about doing after you're saved. Listen, church, every Christian, and fall into this camp, I'm talking all of us, every true believer in Christ has times of unfaithfulness, times of sin, times of barrenness. So I want you to understand, just because you've had those times that you've slipped up, fallen down, fallen on your face, boy, I've really disappointed God, I'm saying to you, you're in the midst of people that have all done the same. It's not something we're proud of, but it's something happens, isn't it? We all do it. But it's during those times that a Christian is in a real danger of losing assurance of salvation. And I, I don't know about you, but I've been in that time before. Really in that time of, hmm, am I, am, I really a, am, I a, am I a real believer or am I not? Losing that assurance. Because the blessing of peace and confidence from the Holy Spirit is forfeited when you sin. When you are unfaithful, when you are disobedient, that blessing of peace that, that God's Holy Spirit offers a believer to keep them secure feeling. That, that you know, you, and you know what I mean? Not floundering. Like, I wonder if, and then you start going in all kinds of different directions trying to figure out how I can regain that. Well, if you're living a life of disobedience and a life of sin, you're forfeiting this blessing of God's Holy Spirit. But your security, the security, I didn't say assurance, I said security of salvation is eternal and permanent. Now why do I say that? It's because it's God that has given you salvation. He's the one that is all powerful, not anyone more powerful than He that can pluck you out of His hand. If you are His, you belong to Him. It is His power 
it is His ability to keep all of those that belong to Him. You, you, you cannot and will not ever lose a true salvation. It's impossible. If you, if you can convince me that there is a, a power out there that is stronger and bigger than God, and you belong to Him, you can, you're going to have to convince me that they are more powerful than God to take you out of His hand. But the assurance of salvation, the assurance of salvation, it's temporal. It can fluctuate. That's why I'm saying all these things. It, it fluctuates along with the wind. Because it's a blessing granted to those that are obedient to God. And I'm just saying to you, there are going to be times when you're not. And have you noticed that whenever you're not obedient, whether you're out of His will, you're choosing a path that does, is not righteous, you're just trying to make it fit in there, do you know how you feel immediately? It's God's Holy Spirit comes upon you and you just feel like, am I really saved or not saved? Why? Because the blessing has been taken away from you. Doesn't mean it. It's all actuality, but I'm saying to you that that feeling of restlessness is gone. Obedience provides blessing. Does that make sense to you guys? And it goes on to say in verse 19, you believe that there is one God, that you do well, even the demons believe and they tremble. That phrase that you do well I don't know if you've noticed, but it carries a kind of a touch of sarcasm. I know that's not a fruit of the Spirit, but he's got a point by saying this. You know, you believe there's one guy, no, you're doing well. But it's pointed toward the conservative, orthodox Jews of that day. Those that had it together. Those that believed the Scriptures were true. But I just need to, I need to point out, and there's a reason why I believe James wrote this and wrote it this way, because it's not only to the Jews of that day, it's also to us as the, as the body of believers today. It's relevant. Just because you believe the Bible and all of its truth doesn't guarantee your place in eternity with Christ. Because the Jews did. They, they believed that, and I'm going to show you why. He points out, it says that even the demons believe and they tremble. So are we going to fit the same category as demons? Because they believe. They know God's God. Don't they? They very, very clearly know that God is God. I mean, you can see that throughout Christ's earthly ministry, that when He came onto the scene, there was a demon-possessed man. That demon said, Whoa! Don't, don't do anything to me, Jesus, Son of God! Acknowledged Him. But the demon wasn't saved. So acknowledgement doesn't mean anything. Because the demons are extremely sure in the sense of knowing and acknowledging the truth about God. Extremely. And conservative Jews, or orthodox Jews, if you want to say it that way, were always centered in their belief in the one true God. And there is a, in the Shema, the words in the Shema says this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This is their statement. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. That's quite a statement. The Lord is our God. Very pointed, very specific. And he goes, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. But this is where they fail. And this is where they went astray. Because the following verse commanded, verse 5, if that's the truth, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's where they went astray, wasn't it? Started serving other things. Yes, the Lord is God. He is one. He is the true God, but I'm going to serve something else. Well, James's point was that believe in the truth of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, without obedience to Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, is a worthless kind of belief. 
that was also possessed by demons. Because the demons acknowledge that fact. How are you any different? You don't have any works that follow your profession. How am I supposed to tell between you and a demon? Hmm. It's an interesting point that he's making, isn't it? And as far as factual doctrine is concerned, factual doctrine, all demons are monotheists. You know, you know what a monotheist is? means that all demons believe in one true God. They know that. <laughs> but it doesn't mean they're saved. The demons are also aware of many other facts of the Scripture. Let me just list seven of them. They believe that Scripture is the Word of God. No argument there. They believe that Jesus is God's Son. They believe that salvation is by grace through faith. They believe that Jesus died, was buried in raised to atone the sins of the world. They believe that Jesus ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. They believe that heaven is a literal place and that hell is a literal place. They also believe that Jesus will return again for His followers. And you say, that sounds just like a Christian. They believe these things. The Scriptures even claim they believe them. But even with all that orthodox, conservative theology, knowledge, and this divinely and eternally significant as it is, that alone cannot save them. And neither can it save you. I claim all those, David. Great. But even the demons believe it. How are you any different than they are? Demons believe that truth about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, but they hate the truth. And they hate the Trinity. How are you any different if you said, yeah, I've got the belief, but your, the acts of your life, the actions that you show, they don't prove anything that you love Jesus. You look just like the world. James says, how can that faith save you? It's impossible. And I also add here that having an orthodox doctrine is immeasurably better than being a heretic. I got it. It is. It's immeasurably better. But mere knowledge cannot bring a person to God and to salvation. It cannot And the troubling thing is, sobering truth, is that many people with solid biblical doctrine will be in the same hell as those that have outright, outlandishly denied God. Why? Because their faith is not real. Empty confession, a false compassion, and a shallow conviction. If that marks you, the road you're going down is not the right road. That's why James puts these landmarks all along the way. Hey David, you're heading east, not west. Do you know what, if anyone with common sense would say, if I'm heading and I see a sign that says Massachusetts on it, I'm going in the wrong direction. Especially if I left Biloxi. So I had to, had to say Massachusetts. Yeah, especially in the winter. There's more and more snow that's accumulating. I'm heading in the wrong direction. <laughs> Whew. Let me remind you, Matthew 7, 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire, therefore by their fruits you will know them. So David, please, remind me what good fruits look like. Just so that I can have a fresh reminder in my head. Because, again, we can conjure up our own little list of things that the do-goods, 
that we think are going to achieve that status of good works. And I'm saying to you, whatever your list is, get rid of it. Because the Bible clearly tells us what the true list is. Those are the works that should be evident in our lives, or at least that we should be striving for to make as fruits producing in our lives. He st- and he gives all out of the book of James. He gives us this list. The first one was found in James 1.3, talking about endurance. Are you in this, in this race of life for the long run? Are you still there? Fifteen years later, am I going to still say, Hey! Brother John, hey, Delis, what's going on? You can give me this whole spiel about how your life is taking this crazy turn, but you know what? I'm still standing. I'm still there serving Jesus. Endurance. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That's what one three says. So is that work there? Perseverance under trial. James one twelve. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Perseverance under trial. We have spent an extensive amount of time talking about enduring through trials. Persevering through trials. Not throwing in the towel. Because it's all about making us to be more like him. A pure life. James one twenty one. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Is your life marked by a pure life? Desiring things that are pure? Ridding yourself of the junk of the world? Obedience to Scripture is another one of those works, those fruits. James 1, 22 and 23. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For anyone who's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man's observing his natural face in a mirror. Does that work there? Again, get rid of your list. Your list does not matter. Quite frankly, I mean, I don't mean to sound ugly, but your opinion doesn't matter. Mine doesn't matter. It's the word of God that matters. This is where we set the standard. This is the list that we should follow. These are the, the signs that are going towards True, genuine faith. Compassion for the needy. James 1.27 Pure and undefiled religion for God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You know, we, we don't... And look, we're not mastering all of these. But is, is your, when you see something, compassion for the needy, you think, oh man, you know what? I'm lacking in this area. You know what? Lord, give me some more strength in this area. Give me some... Give me a desire to be compassionate. Give me an opportunity to meet a need. That's when we know that there's true, genuine faith. Not that you've mastered the list. Not that all of these are blossom fruits that are in your life. But when you look at them, you go, I know this is what I need. And you strive to change it. You know what a a lost person does? Not a big deal. Blow it off. Impartiality. We spend a lot of time talking about that. James 2, 1 through 9. Acts of compassion. James 2, 15. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, are you showing signs of compassion to people that need something or help? We hadn't quite got here yet, and I think I'm going to resign before we do. Control of the tongue. Keith, I need you to fill in for me. Or Delis, either one. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 12. We'll get there. I think many of us will leave hurt. Humility, James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Is that sign there? Is that fruit of humility there? Truthfulness, do you speak the truth? James 4.11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. You're not a judge. Quit judging people. Who made you judge? And then this one. Oh, ouch, each, out, out, patience. 
James 5.8, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's the list. Not one that you've conjured up, but that's the list. Biblically, those are the fruits that should be being produced from your life. And if those fruits don't follow the profession of Christ as Savior and Lord, or your desire, again, is not to produce those fruits, I'm saying to you, you need to ask them very serious questions about your faith. Well, all of us feel much better now that we've come today, haven't we? And this is the day I choose to come to church. Well, if you know, I always say, if you don't feel a little punched or abused, you're not doing things right. I need to know on a deeper level what it means to be a believer. This is not just for a pastor. This is for all of us as believers in Christ. That we should walk according to His ways and know that when we walk, we're going in the right direction. It's no fun to see a sign for Kentucky when you're heading to Bogalusa. And my wife says, Amen. Let's pray. Father, on the deepest level, I pray that you would speak to our hearts spiritually, speak to our hearts to let us know that the path that we're walking is the right path. Father, we don't need to make mistakes in this area. We need to know what it means to have genuine faith. And I pray that if pride is in the way, I pray that we will lay down that pride that will we'll lay down anything that hinders us from walking your righteous path. Father, thank you for the truth. You provide it through your Spirit to our hearts because you desire for us to know it. If these were to remain mysteries, they would still be a mystery. But they've been made known to us for us to walk in that truth. So help us to do that, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you and thank you that you love us enough to give us truth. Help us to walk in it. Let us honor you. Let us praise and worship you with our lives, lives of obedience. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.